The Pope is in trouble again, and this time from a young man in a Zoom meeting uh, from a university in the Philippines, and he he, he was quite he was quite direct. Uh, Jack Lorenz Acabedo Riviera uh, said that the Pope's use of the word uh, "fracchine" was offensive and had caused him immense pain, and he says, stop using offensive language against the LGBTQ plus people. And uh, the, the, the Pope uh, has used this word twice, and um, it's a derogatory Italian term referring to gay people, um, and he reportedly used it during an informal discussion with Italian bishops on June the 10th, 2023, and the remarks provoked significant public and media response, leading to clarifications and discussions with the Vatican and the broader Catholic community. Um, the exact context and the intent of the term um, remains a matter for debate and interpretation, but he seems to have uh, then, according to reports, used it a second time. Now, the problem with all this is not only the offensive nature of the term. Now, of course, Italian is not his first language, and so he may not, in, he, you know, there, there, there were people initially saying that he may not fully have realized the impact of the derogatory expression. And But, but the fact that he's used it a second time means he's, I, he's almost certainly fairly aware of of what he's as what of what he's saying unless he's slipped into some sort of nonsense um but the real problem here is the impact of the of the concept of his authority and the the, the lurking idea of papal infallibility and one shouldn't confuse the two so his authority is absolute, and and as a result, um, Mr. Riviero uh, made an appeal to the Pope to allow divorce, which is illegal at the moment in the Philippines. And but the, but the Pope didn't didn't respond to any of this. Um, he he waited until all the uh, all the guests in the Zoom conversation had finished talking, and then he talked rather rather vaguely and rather aloofly, about always pick true love, women are the best people, many women have brought children up on their own, a widower can hardly go on their own, a woman alone can certainly grow her family, this is the greatness of women. I, it makes very little sense, really, given the um, point that Mr. Rivero made to start with. And Mr. Mr. Rivero, of course, has attracted headlines because he was so direct to the pontiff. But this idea of papal infallibility, uh, um, which is certainly recognize the concept of authority and the slightly surprising way in which uh, a young man has spoken directly to the Pope, and maybe a few more people should do the same. Um, but certainly the Pope is not speaking infallibly when he talks about um, when, 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 when he uses these derogatory terms he's not speaking infallibly the, the the idea of infallibility is very confusing because it was pronounced during the first Vatican Council so in 1870 and according to the doctrine the Pope is infallible when he speaks ex cathedra from the chair as a Pope as a bishop um, and so, so the, the chair of the bishop is the um, yeah, gives gives the church its name of, of cathedral. Uh, but when he speaks ex cathedra um, on matters of faith and morals, so only on those, and only within the context of the uh, of the traditions and the belief of the whole church. So. One could say since the since the formulation of that belief, there have only been two infallible 
statements, but one of those anticipated the doctrine of infallibility anyway. So there's only ever been one infallible statement. And Paul VI's pronouncement about birth control was not an infallible statement. It was a papal opinion um, after a... Um, after a, a a committee had done had done its work, the committee advised in favour of birth control, and Paul VI changed changed his mind, um, making a making a formal statement with authority, but not but not infallibility. So the two infallible statements are uh, eighteen fifty four, the Declaration of uh, by Pius the Ninth the Declaration of the Immaculate Conception of Mary, and 1950, Pius XII, the Declaration of the Assumption of Mary. Um, but as I say, one of those actually anticipates or precedes the definition of papal infallibility in 1870. So there's only ever been one statement of, well, one infallible statement, and that was the 1950 definition of the Assumption of Mary, which brings Catholic uh, traditions about the Virgin Mary in line with Orthodox traditions, just about. But, but again, it, um, it, <laughs> it talks about when, when her earthly life was over, so it, 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 it elides over the question about whether the Virgin Mary died, and it's a very ambiguous statement. And the Dormition of the Virgin is one of the great feasts of the Orthodox Church. And it parallel is now paralleled in the Catholic Church with the Assumption of the Virgin Mary. Two different concepts, uh, but um, celebrating the same idea of the... Um, uh, of, of, of the, uh, uh, the the importance of the Virgin Mary within the within the traditions of the of the Church. So uh, some qualifications and a rebuke and a well timed rebuke and some headlines. Well done. <laughs>